Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's there. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through every season So why would He fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail
Just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart burn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me.
church, you may be seated. Has God been faithful to you? Amen. Amen. Oh, that was weak. Like, I would almost conclude that he hasn't been faithful to you, the way that you respond. Has God been faithful to you? Amen. Yes, he has. Um, we're going to go to prayer. Uh, I'm Pastor Steve here at Orchard Ridge. Uh, I was thinking um, today is Easter, um, Easter in August, because we've been in the Gospel of Mark since really the the second Sunday of January. And today we're looking at the resurrection story, the very end of Gospel of Mark, and we're we're done with that book. It's taken us three quarters of a year to get through it. Uh, But as we're going to prayer, uh, and I was preparing remotely, getting ready for this morning, it occurred to me that there's kind of two different crosses that the Christian community looks to. You know, if you're in a if you're in a Catholic community, I think the Orthodox too would kind of be this way. I'm not sure. Um, but if you were to go to one of those churches, you'd see a cross and what would be on it? it would, Jesus would be on the cross. And we call that a crucifix. He, he's up there. Um, in most all Protestant churches, you'll see what's behind me, some variation of that, but it's a cross. And Jesus is not on there. And I just want to tell you, this isn't a, a case of, well, who's right and who's wrong? The answer is, who is right? And you say, yes, they both are. We needed Jesus on that cross to be our payment for our sin. And I don't think we should ever forget that he got up on that cross. They nailed him unnecessarily. You know, the ropes would have held him there only for his balance. He would have done that. Love, love held him to the cross, not nails. And uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That's what the King James, they word it that way. And so that, that reminder as we see Jesus up on the cross, you should never forget that. Nor should you ever forget who you were before you met Christ. I want to forget Uh, when moments of the old flesh rise up in me, even as a Christian, I want to, that needs to be crucified, nailed to the cross. Um, But it's also important to know that he didn't stay up on the cross. Easter Sunday says, and and I prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. Um, On this day, we're reminded, not only did the cross hold him, Um, The tomb did not hold him. We serve a risen Savior. He is alive, and we will be alive forever in him. And so with that little thought, I think that's a good way to go into our prayer time because you're not praying to a dead God. You're you're praying to a living Savior who hears you um, and and who empathizes. I I just feel I'm going to do this right now. This is a sermon point that I won't be preaching because I won't preach it right now. You know that Jesus, in every way, was tempted, just as you're tempted. He went through the entire human experience, including from the beginning when he was born. You know, he he had to make his way through this, the same way we all made our way into this world. And it's too graphic for him to stop right there. But he was born, okay, of a woman. He also had to go through death. And of all the ways a human can die, I mean, there's nobody that can say, yeah, but I died a more gruesome death than him. I mean, he said, give it to me. Give it to me the worst way that a person can die. Wow. When you pray to that risen Savior, we're going to go to prayer right here. Whatever you got going on in your world, he gets it. There's an ad campaign on right now, the Super Bowl, whatever, and they say, he, he gets us.com or whatever. You see those? Right? When you pray, he gets you. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one that was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So, wow, on Easter Sunday, as we preach about it anyway, uh, let's take that with us as we go to prayer, okay? Uh, Lots going on this week. Um, 
Well, if you're not doing anything Thursday, I, I'm going to go support um, Kurt and his wife, Laura. The, the two of them head up varsity football in cheerleading at Romeo High School. This is our hometown, small town, and I'm so proud of him when I go to the football games, not because he's a great coach, and he is, but because he cares far more about the character and the development. And that line that exists between separation of church and state, he knows where that line is, but boy, he leans hard against that line. He goes as far up to that line as the law will let him. And every one of his players knows that in his own personal life, he is a man of faith. And so I, I go just to support one of ours making a difference in the community. And that's worth nine bucks or whatever it is for a ticket to get in there on a, on a Thursday night this, this week. Um, if you're not doing anything for the Peach Festival... Go watch the parade because the little Orchard Ridger is the queen of that. She's the peach queen, right? Joanna Cowles, it's kind of a neat deal, right? Yes. <clears throat> so do that. Mom and dad are here. She couldn't make it. She's got some other things going on today, but I could go on and on. Kelly McLeod, I don't know if she's here, but she was honored big time this week. We've got amazing teachers at this church. Let's go to prayer. Whatever you have... Let's bring it to these altars and remember that you have a, a Christ who died for you on the cross, but a Christ who rose from the grave and now sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession or prayers on behalf of all of us. So let's, let's go to prayer. All right, these altars are open. Please silence your devices and uh, enter a spirit of thanksgiving and expectation of how God's going to speak to you. We believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and will be saved. <clears throat> saved for eternity, saved from the obstacles and the, the forces that would set themselves up against us. 
God, may we not walk alone, but may we walk with our brothers and sisters, and most importantly, may we walk with you. Lord, as we open up the curtain of separation which you have ripped open, making a holy God accessible to us today, we are in the inner chamber. We are in the place that had once been forbidden for man to go. We are here with you. And because of the robes of righteousness that we wear, not of our own making, but that we have been gifted by a loving Father through the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, stained with his blood, purple in royalty. Because of that covering, we can come boldly before the throne of grace to ask for help to t- in our times of need and to offer praise in our seasons of victories. And even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we, we want to give praise to your name. Father, you are the God that won't let us down. We can look back on, on past trials. You have, we have always emerged from those uh, better if having trusted in you, and I pray for every single person here, whatever they're facing this week, may they walk with you and experience the victory that only you can bring, Father. Um, We pray for, again, once again, for our educators, for our students, for the campuses that will open this week. Um, Lord, I, I just pray that you would put a hedge of angels all around our brother Kurt is we know he leads like Jesus he's humble in his approach but I pray that where he cannot use words that the light of Christ the aura of Christ would not only empower him but speak through him may he not have to come up with what to say in any given situation but may those words be provided by you. Lord, bless his home, his wife. Thank you for the work Laura does with uh, those that are on the sideline cheering. We realize that that's a team game as well. And Lord, really don't want to single anybody out. The truth of it is we've got so many wonderful, wonderful people here that are involved in so many different ways. Be with all of our educators, we pray. And Lord, thank you for Joanna. You've given her a unique platform, a unique opportunity um, to take you wherever she goes. And I pray that chance to speak, that she would use every word for the glory of God. God, help this pastor and help pastors like me that are bringing the word today. People don't need to be entertained. They don't need eloquent delivering, they need to hear from you. And I pray, dear God, that I would be lost in the shadow of the cross today and that only the message of hope found in the gospel would resonate and come out of my mouth. And may the life-giving words, Peter said, where else can we go? Where are we going to go, Lord? Only you have the words of life. And I pray that the words of life would would be poured out into our hearts today. And where there were parts of us that are beginning to die, may we all experience resurrection power this morning that would encourage us to carry on and to walk forward in faith. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. I'm uh, Pastor Leon. I missed you guys last week. I'm the executive pastor here. We're going to transition from a time of worshiping in song, <clears throat> worshiping in prayer, to worshiping and receiving a tithes and offerings. If you're visiting with us today, um, you'd like to let us know who you are. We have these communication cards on the round tables and also on the welcome table. If you'd fill that out and drop it in the box between the doors on your way out, we'd appreciate that. Uh, ushers, would you come forward as we pray? God in heaven, we pause in this moment, recognizing that you are the giver of life. Not only do you give life, you sustain us. 
that you provide for us and that everything that we might attach our name to really is a gift from you. That You've entrusted those gifts to us. And Father, in this moment, we worship you by giving back some of those resources to you. Father, we pray for your blessing upon not just the ministries that happen here at Orchard Ridge on this campus, but also in our community through the Samaritan House and Abigail Ministries and through missionaries around the world supported by the tithes and offerings that are received here. And in all these things, we give you glory, we give you praise, and all God's people said, amen. I'm a little nervous this morning because <clears throat> I'm going to do something that Pastor Steve asked me not to do. Okay. So I have a letter from our district superintendent that he has asked to be read to our church family at Orchard Ridge. And before I read it, I think I should give some context to the letter. One of the things that drew me to the Church of the Nazarene is our structure. We have both a top-down and a bottom-up approach to church leadership. Our church leaders are elected by our membership, and I encourage you to come back tonight at 6 p.m. to hear more about our church structure, our church history, our church future. Uh, we talk about what we expect of our leaders and out of our members. And besides following Jesus, the only other requirement for membership here is attending one of these welcome classes held about twice a year. However, if you just want to come and learn about Orchard Ridge without becoming an official member, that's okay too. Our church manual outlines how our pastor is elected. Now, you may think that that didn't happen here, but it kind of did. How our, our pastor is elected, his responsibilities, and requires a periodic review with the church leadership team every four years. Well, because of the pandemic, Pastor Steve's review was delayed until this month. At this review meeting, the question of continuing the pastoral church relationship shall be discussed, is what the manual says. And the objective is to dis discover consensus without the need of a formal church leadership vote. So here's the letter that contains the results of that meeting. I know you're all on edge. On Thursday, August 15th, 2024, the Orchard Ridge Church of the Nazarene leadership team Pastor Steve Barkey and District Superintendent Michael Kitsko spent time together reviewing the ministry of our church, church board, and pastor. We reviewed everything, we reviewed everything working well and discovered incredible areas of strength which God has blessed. We, the Orchard Ridge leadership team, wholeheartedly support Pastor Steve. He is our pastor and leader. We believe the church can be an even stronger participant in ministry. We commit to strong, prayerful support of our pastor and pastoral staff and his wife, Sharon, who if I ask, stand over there in a moment, we're going to recognize her. We rejoice in Pastor Steve's ministry. We believe through our pastor's many strengths, gifts, and leadership, God will continue building our church. As we look for, toward and plan for our shared future, we want Pastor Steve and Sharon to know we support you and love you. We want you to be our pastor for as long as the Lord leads. Pastor Steve and the church leadership team, in consultation with the district superintendent, formally renewed his call to Orchard Ridge four more years, or as long as the Lord shall lead you. We believe great days are in front of us. We will work together, intentionally planning, focusing, and making a kingdom invitational difference in our local community. Grace and peace, Mike Kitsko. Pastor Steve, would you stand, Sharon? We love you. Thank you. Let me close by making uh, by this announcement by confir confirming with you that we choose our pastor. He or she is not appointed by the district unless we become a church in crisis, which we are not. Praise be to God. Thank you, Pastor Steve, for your leadership here. Okay, that was the longest announcement that I think he'll ever let me make. <laughs> a couple more announcements, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you have the, the pulpit here. Um, I mentioned that the, the uh, dinner tonight, um, two services begin in just a couple of weeks. September 8th, there'll be a 9 o'clock and a 10.45. Um, thank you for all of you that have si raised your hand and said, yes, I will serve. I saw some people shadowing other people today in ministry. It is great watching how God is building his kingdom here at Orchard Ridge through you and through us. Um, prayer and Bible study on Wednesday nights. 
um, will resume after Labor Day. So it won't be this week, won't be next week, but it will be um, after Labor Day um, on the 11th, okay? Um, and then my last two announcements, the Primetimer Dinner is coming up on September 14th. For those of us that are 55 and older, uh, we need your RSVP by the 8th. Let my mom know, Sharon, she's in the second row here. And the Ladies Homecoming Tea coming up September 21st. Um, sign up starts today. See Phyllis, she's over here in this section, uh, second row from the back. And then finally, our Fall Harvest Celebration. Put that on your calendar. It's October 12th when we engage the community and share our love for Christ. Pastor Steve, would you come and bring the word? Okay, the rest of the service is going to be a 35-minute announcement on the senior pastor of the church, because I'm just the associate pastor. Uh, his name is Jesus, by the way, so <laughs> that's what this is going to be. Okay, um, well, let's pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll just dive in here. It's going to be good stuff. Father, we thank you for the word. Um, we thank you that it's a living word, that we can read the same chapter 20 times in 20 different days and get something unique and fresh from it for each one of those days. And so, Lord, as we honor your word, as we read it, I pray that it would not just go from the screen uh, through our eyes to our brains, but I pray that it would make the, the longest journey from our brains to our hearts to the inner chamber where the soul resides. And Lord, would you clean up anything that needs to get cleaned up there? And may we be washed and renewed through the word and forever changed and transformed to be more and more like yourself. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to read uh, Mark 16, which just has 20 verses in it. It's a, it's a short chapter. And some might argue it's even shorter than that. We're going to look at something here that Mark 16 has eight verses that are without any form of controversy, um, but verses 9 through 20 have a little something that some might say would equal controversy. I would tell you that if it's in the Bible, that issue has settled with me, so it's not. So I want to read it, and it's going to be up on the screen. That's what we've been doing, chapter and verse. We haven't missed one verse out of Mark as we've been on this journey. You've read it all if you've been here. Um, as we read it, I would ask you to read with expectation. I want you to expect that God is going to speak to you as we go through this. That he is going to say something to you. He's going to show you something that might not even come up in my sermon. But the Lord is going to speak through his word to you. And so I would ask you to come into this exercise with me with the spirit of expectation that that would take place, and that he would open your eyes to see and open your ears to hear. Um, and then I'm going to give you just a little bit of information. I think it's important to do a little bit of cognitive, oh, I get it, academic, if you will. But you don't come here for class. You come here to be inspired. There is an inspiration that happens from the Holy Spirit, an inspiration that leads to transformation. And that's where I want to camp out for the bulk of our time together. But here we go. Let's read this with expectation. It's the glorious story of the risen Christ. As told by Mark, we believe uh, through this real story of Peter, Mark writing. Verse 1 of chapter 16. When the Sabbath, or Saturday, was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, which is why we as Christians worship on Sunday. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away at the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. 
See the place where they lay him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. They were in Jerusalem, right around Jerusalem. Galilee was the place where he had called them. It's where the poor people lived. And they were fishermen up to the north. So he said, go there and he'll meet you there. Verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. These next verses, verse 9 through 20, I'm going to read it as though continuous and then we'll talk about it. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. And afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. This is the road to Emmaus. They're referring to Cleopas, and, uh, an unnamed disciple. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. And later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. And I would also add that there are some early manuscripts of the word that have a verse in between verses 8 and 9 where those are that says this. Then they quickly reported all of these instructions to those around Peter. And after this, Jesus himself also sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. So what is this stuff about early manuscripts? What is this stuff about the earliest manuscripts don't have verses 9 through 20? Should verses 9 through 20 be in the Bible? And all that stuff. I want you to watch a one-minute video. I'm going to make a brief comment on this. And then there's all kinds of stuff you can study on it. But I'm going to tell you where I'm at and why I'm there. Can we go ahead and, and play that video? One of the most puzzling parts of Mark's gospel is the ending because it, it ends so abruptly. Um, in our earliest manuscripts, the gospel ends in verse eight, which says that the women were terrified, were frightened, and they had heard the announcement of the resurrection, but they said nothing to anyone. That's a very strange way to end the gospel. Uh, there is a longer ending, verses nine through 20, but it's clearly not written in Mark's style. It's different vocabulary, different style, different theology. Almost certainly Mark didn't write those last 10 or so verses, verses 9 to 20. Uh, so what happened? Well, some scholars think that last page was lost, in fact. Probably a better solution, however, is that Mark intended to end his gospel that abruptly, because the gospel itself is a call to respond. Just like the women, the readers of the gospel have heard the announcement of the resurrection. How are they going to respond to that announcement? Are they going to respond with faith or with fear? So the whole gospel becomes a call to decision. Okay, so let's just, let's just stop right there. If Mark wasn't the author of verses 9 through 20, is that a problem? Maybe it's a problem for you. It's not a problem for me. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Psalms was written by who? Okay, I'm going to get you here. Because most of you are going to say David. And you would be mostly right. Most of the Psalms, we believe, were authored by King David. 
But there are, if you go through it, it even says, uh, this, this psalm was from, from somebody else, and this one, was, this one we don't even know. You know, we don't know the author of the book of Hebrews. Doesn't make it any less inspired to me. By the way, we do know the author of the book of Hebrews. It is the word of God. It is God working through men to, it was part of the canon. Because the author in and of itself is not the thing that I'm going to, you know, we're going to latch on to. So if there was somebody else who it would appear that that's the case because there is a certain style, everything that that man just said, who was a very respected gospel theologian, um, it, it doesn't matter to me. Proverbs is the same way. If I said, who wrote Proverbs? You're going to say Solomon. Not all of them. Um, It doesn't make it any less. The other thing is this. I like how he said there's this abrupt ending which leads, it's the call to go. You see these women were sent, the first messengers, to, to go and tell that he is not here. The tomb is empty and they were given that message and they were sent to go tell it. And they were the first ones given that charge. And you and I are also given that charge to go and tell that he is not in the tomb, he is not in the grave. Um, This is another thing that I would say. As we go through the verses of 9 through 20, and I'm just going to pick a few things that are within that, this is what I would say. Nothing in there contradicts anything else we read in the other Gospels. There's nothing in there that would say, oh, we got this mystery author for... 11 verses. Is it saying something different than we're going to find in in John's gospel, in Matthew, and in Luke? No, it's not. It's it's complementary, if anything. And so with that, I don't know who wrote it. I really don't care because it's in there. We have two early manuscripts. They're they're Codus Syndicus and Codus uh, Vaticanus or something like that. And those are the ones that stop at verse 8. The vast majority of all of our Greek early manuscripts have 1 through 20. So I'm preaching today as though all of it is the word of God, because I believe that all of it is the word of God. There's a couple of things that come up there, and I guarantee you as you are reading it, you're like, whoa. (laughs) The thing on handling snakes, these signs will accompany them. They're going to be able to pick up snakes and not get bit and drink poison. You won't die. And, I mean, it's almost like, you know, there are Christian groups that have taken these things and adopted them as practice and even proof that you're really saved. (laughs) Oh, you're a Christian? Prove it. Go get the snake, Bob. You know, go in the back room and get the snake. We're going to see if you're really a, a Christian or not. Hold this viper, you know, or, oh, you're a Christian? Let's go whip up, set the communion aside. we got to get the poison cocktail, and we're going to see if they are. That's not what this says. It says that signs will accompany them. All of us set out with doing the work of the sent to proclaim the gospel that the tomb is empty, that Christ is alive. You can talk to missionaries that have gone to foreign fields, and they'll tell you some stories that make your hair curl. Um, What Jesus is saying here is there will be signs and wonders that will accompany those who are doing the work of God. I have seen signs and wonders accompany our work here at Orchard Ridge where he has gone before us and done miraculous things. Understand this, my friends, when when Pentecostal charismatic weird groups, and there's some good charismatic Pentecostal groups, but there's some wackos out there that want to take some of these things and they want to take signs and wonders and worship signs and wonders. Where is your focus on in your Christian walk? It should be on one thing and one thing only, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. My focus is on him I have a call on my life. You have a call on your life. You focus on that. And as you're doing the work of God, there will be signs and wonders that will happen. Things will happen on your journey 
where you're not going to say, oh, yeah, check this out. Um, In Jesus' name, I declare it, I decree it, and watch it happen. That kind of stuff is not to be superior to just serving the Lord. And so, so he'll do those things. And by the way, we know in the book of Acts, which is where we're going next, we're going to start in Acts on September the 8th. But in the book of Acts, Peter, I mean, um, Paul is shipwrecked, and they're starting a fire, and he, he goes over to the firewood p- pile, because they're going to start a fire, and he reaches his hand into this bush or whatever to get some wood, and a viper just latches on. And they're all watching, and they're thinking, oh, this guy is cursed because he just got bit, but, and we know that snake. He, he's got about three minutes or whatever. To, he's going to die. And they watch. Nothing happens to Paul. And then they were, like, going to worship him. They thought he was a god or something. Like, how did this guy get bit by that snake and nothing happened? And, and that is a fulfillment of this kind of thing. And I'm sure that Paul wasn't the only one doing the work of God that had a a potentially lethal situation that he was protected from. But it's no less a believer. What about the martyrs of our faith? What about Stephen, the first martyr, when he took rocks in the head and and ended up dying for the cause of Christ? What about Jim Elliott? And this, his story of his family that reaching the Alka Indians down in, in the Amazon region in the 50s. It was on Time magazine. It was a national story. The entire missions team of like four or five men all killed. And their wives got out of there. And the Lord convicted the wives to go back. And they went back. And it was their act of forgiveness that these men had never seen some, them kill off a whole group like that. And then these women came and showed them what forgiveness looked like, what Christian love really was. The entire tribe received Christ. All of them got baptized. Incredible story. So I can go on and on. There, there's a story not in the Bible, but it's in church history. Eusebius, an uh, early church historian, writes about it where John and Barnabas in his account, were forced to drink poison and they lived through it. And so when you read that kind of stuff, just know this, your God can. Your God can save you from the snake and the poison and anything else that might set itself up against you. So when you go to prayer and you ask for healing and for whatever else, you better believe he can. And you trust him. That if he will, or if he won't, or not yet, thy will be done, Father. I'll trust you for the outcome, but let there be no doubt that I believe that you can. So we can go into all that, but that's, that's the knowledge part of it. And I also just say, to get the whole, if we only had Mark to learn about Easter, if we only had Mark to learn about the resurrection, it'd be a short story. But we've got John, we've got Matthew, we've got Luke. That's where we take the whole thing. You realize that's kind of a, what I'll call a microcosm of what we do with the entirety of Scripture. In the same way that we take the four Gospels and we distill them into one story. You don't build your doctrine on anything on a verse. Because if we did, we would say that you got to be baptized or you're going to hell. Oh, it says it right there in the Bible. Those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Didn't it say that? I just read it. But that's half the verse. Keep reading. Those who do not believe will be condemned. Condemnation or not going to heaven is based on one thing alone. Belief. If you believe and are baptized, if you believe, you will be baptized. Because why wouldn't you? You're going to do it. You're saying, I'm with Christ. I'm with him. I identify myself with him. I'm going to to identify with him in the death, burial, and resurrection under the water, and I'm coming back out. If I'm believed, I'm going to be. But it's unbelief that will do that. Tonight, if you come to this class, and I encourage you to come. Hey, if you're a member and you just want to dust up a little bit, we're going to go through what's a Presbyterian, what's a Baptist, what's a Nazarene, what's a... We're going to look at all that stuff. You're going to know who we are. I'm going to take your questions. won't just be preaching like I am tonight.
interactive, and there'll be something to eat, so come hungry. <laughs> With all that said, um, let's get into some, what I would say is some inspiration, and these are some things that I was going through. Oh, I, I got to finish my thought. Sorry, that happens a lot. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the word. What, what in the world does that mean? The plenary. You know, when I go to a convention, they have small group workshops. They have the meetings for the missions. They have the meeting for the youth ministry people. We have our general, con, general assembly in the Church of the Nazarene. And they got us all over the place. But then they have plenary sessions. You know what that is? It's where everybody comes together. That's in the big hall. And we're all there. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible. Meaning, this one verse is anointed, and it's true, but so is the whole thing. So if I want to build something on this, it better be consistently backed up by all the other verses that are in the Word. Because I believe in the plenary inspiration of the Word. I believe it's all inspired. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for correction, rebuking, learning, growing in righteousness, right? That's what Paul told Timothy. So with that, let's get inspired now and see some things in here that hopefully will lead to transformation. First thing I note from the passage that we just read is that Mary Magdalene went all by herself to the tomb. Did your Bible say that? No, didn't, did it? She went with three. I want to talk about this walk. I don't know how long the walk was, but the walk to wherever it was where they tried to sleep, and I don't think they got a lot of good sleep. I've never experienced death of somebody before they were supposed to die that was that close to me. Some of, many of you in here have. And my hunch is that you would tell me that the night of that night of their passing, you didn't sleep like a baby. You, you tossed, you turned. You probably found a way to get up just because you couldn't lay there anymore. And I think that that's where these women were as soon as they were able to. They got up and they went from the place that they were with zero expectations of what they were going to see. They were going there in the same way that you take your flowers to lay at the grave, to memorialize, to remember all of the best of who that person was. They didn't take flowers, they took spices. Jesus had already been, in, uh, not embalmed, but Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had taken, I think they, the word says 70 pounds of stuff. You know, I mean, we know what they did to his body. And the, the smell of a decaying corpse so they lathered 70 pounds of all of that kind of creams and whatever that stuff was on him, and then they wrapped every arm, the arm separately, the leg separately, the midsection separately, and then all of it is one. This sounds like a mummy movie, but that's kind of what it was. And then over the face was the shroud. And I'm not talking about the shroud of Turin right now, but you know what that is. So then something went over his face. They were going in there with their spices which was just like perfume on top of the whole thing, but the hard work had been done by these two men who were both Pharisees on the Jewish council that got him crucified. So not every Pharisee was bad. Two of them tried to prevent it, at least two. Maybe there were more. At any rate, there were three of them, and I think that that's meaningful because I want to talk about that walk. You know, Jesus tells all of us, he says, Brianna, be my disciple. Come follow me, right? Gina, be my disciple. Come follow me. And he only gives you one step. Well, Jesus, what's going to happen five days from now? No, no. Just follow me today. Go to church. I'm going to speak to you there. And then your next step will be whatever when you leave here. Come follow me. I love these women who take that message of come follow me. They follow him all the way to the tomb. When it appears it's over, they're even following him right to the end. Here's an important thing. The last verse of chapter 15, 
is verse 47, and it says right there that Mary Magdalene saw the place where they laid him. There's some goofballs out there that want to say, well, they probably went to the wrong tomb. (laughs) Uh, No. Um, She knew where it was. The church knew where it was. And so when she goes there, the journey when you walk with Christ, over and over we see the power of being in twos and threes. If you're not having any victory, if you just keep falling into traps of sin, I can almost guarantee you, you're not confessing that sin to two other brothers. I just almost guarantee you. And you want to break the power of a sin in your life? Get two other brothers that you can trust and get honest and tell them, this sin is kicking my butt. I'm just getting destroyed here. And you watch the power, what happens when you do that. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to be ashamed. We don't want to live in in that whatever. Ladies, it's the same with you. If you're just walking all by yourself, if it's Mary Magdalene going to see Jesus at the tomb, no. And so then the next thing that we see, not only is that they're going there, is they have this thought. The thought pops into their head. And by the way, you know, so as this obstacle forms, obstacles usually form in our mind. We have a tendency to write these narratives, but Mary Magdalene knew about the stone because she saw where they laid him. And there was a practice of, and the Jewish leadership really wanted this thing protected because they knew that he had predicted that he would rise from the grave. And so they, in their minds, were thinking either A, he's going to do that, or more likely for some of them, it was B, that they were going to steal the body and then come up with this myth that Jesus had rose from the grave like he said he would. So they had Roman guards stationed there. They had sealed the tomb with a Roman seal so, so that that wouldn't happen. Well, on their way along the journey, the thought comes to them. There's, there's a barrier, actually two barriers. There's the stone, and then there's these Roman guards. I thought about actually acting this out where Levi, you could be Jesus over there, and then we'd get big Sean Mirzvati and Coach Rhinus and some of the big husky men, and you know, just be the barrier in front of where you're over there, and then get little little ladies like Sharon Ross and Ava and little ones like walking with their spices, like they're going to get through those guys to get to where they want to be. They had a choice to make, as we all have choices. You know, there's barriers. If only it was just an easy walk to go see Jesus. (laughs) You go to try to pray, and it's a war to even get your mind focused so you can pray. How many many times you want to get to Jesus, they're just wanting to go and put the spices on them, but then the thought hits them. Oh, boy, we can't do that. There's a big rock in the way. The word doesn't say they had the concern about the Roman soldiers, but that was also a barrier. What are your barriers to faith? What are, what are the things that stand in the way of you being able to get to the Christ on the other side? By the way, at this point, this isn't, this isn't oh, let's go see the risen Savior. This is like, no. C- can I just tell you that what they were doing is a good place for you to begin? I want to talk to you, those of you that you need a breakthrough. There's, there's something in the way. This is the spot in the notes where you fill in the blank. Because your barriers are all different. I'm, I'm going to list what some of them are. Well, I got a lot of notes. It's not good. <laughs> These are some of the barriers. These are the rocks. There's a huge one. Number one, unmet expectations of God and of people. I mean, you signed up for the Jesus thing, and you thought this was going to happen. When you signed up for Jesus, you thought your marriage would go like this. When you signed up for Jesus, you thought all of your children would live to be long and old, and, and they would bury you. When you signed up, okay, so we can keep going here. But all of you here, there are people that stay away from God because they've been disappointed. They've been disappointed by God 
or they've been disappointed by people, and then they blame God because people have disappointed them. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. Um, two, unbelief. Where does unbelief come from? I have to see it, taste it, smell it, touch it, whatever. For many people, unbelief is a barrier. Unbelief might come because of number one, because they've been disappointed. I take you to Mark 9, 24, which, where a man says, Lord, I believe, now help me overcome my unbelief. God can't help you exclusively with your problem of, of not believing. You have to start. You don't have to have much. The Bible says the, the size of a mustard seed will get it going. But you've got to believe that he's there when you're speaking to him. And then he can help you with your unbelief. But unbelief is a stone in the way of Christ. Here's a big one. I'm going to leave it here. This is the last one I want to give you. There's probably more, but I'm going to just give you this one. The barrier of you. <laughs> you. You're the one in the way of you and Jesus. What do I mean by you? Here's what I mean. The God that you seek to, come, to, to, to go towards will have no other gods before him. So going to him requires... I mean, what did all the, the people that where he said, come follow... Peter, he fell on his, on his knees before Christ after he saw the, the miraculous catch of fish, and he said, Lord, go away from me. I'm an unholy man. You don't know who you're messing with here. You're holy, and I'm not. Go away. And Jesus, after his humility, he, he, he said, come on, you're okay. You come follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Zacchaeus up in the tree. Come on down from there, Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus came down, and then he knelt you're a barrier between you and God if you won't submit yourself to his plan and his will. People will temporarily disappoint you. People will get in your way. People will hurt you. People will sin against you. And while we're at it, you've hurt and sinned against other people. So you might be the part of somebody else's struggle to believe in God, something that you've done which leads us all in a big hot mess that only Christ can untangle this knot. Amen? And so these are the barriers that, that stand in the way. But the response, this is huge. Don't forget this one. Somewhere in that journey, it dawned on Mary. Got the spices, check. Got my girls with me, check. Oh my goodness. How are we going to get that stone out of the way? It's a two-ton pound stone. And that's even if you can get past, past the, the guards. Practicality, the people of unbelief would say, let's go home. Stop right there in the tracks, turn around, go on home. Because we know what's ahead. There's a rock in front of it. And the, but faith keeps walking. You got that? I got my spices. I'm going to go see Jesus. Yeah, but there's a rock there. There's, there's a barrier there. I'm going to go to Christ. Who's going to roll the stone away? I don't know, but I'm, but I'm going to keep walking. <laughs> Let's see what happens when they get there. And it says, when they looked up, that they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> That's awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we need the help of people. Sometimes we need to be the hands and feet of Christ. We saw this earlier in Mark when they had the paralytic friend and they had to cut the hole in the roof to get them to Christ. There was a barrier, the roof. They, had, they did that. But we serve a God who moves barriers. Let me say something about that rock because some people don't get this. Jesus rises from the dead on the other side of the rock, in the tomb. You notice how this is my tomb over here. The rock's here. You can be Jesus. You be the angel, okay? We have this picture, if you will. Now I just went off the screen for Facebook. Sorry, Facebookers. And it's almost like this, you know, like Jesus is like, okay, Father, I'm back. Bang, bang, bang on the backside of the rock. Let me out. 
So we need, he needs the help of the angel, right, to get the stone out of the way because Jesus is resurrected, but he's trapped behind that rock. Can I just tell you something, friends? The moving of the rock was not for, God's, for Jesus' benefit. We know that later in the same day. If you go to the other gospel accounts, the disciples are in the upper room, and the word specifically says that the doors are locked. They are terrified. They're not out trying to steal the body to create a myth. They are locked in the upper room, afraid for their lives. And Jesus just shows up. He just pops up. That stone getting moved was not so he could get out. The stone being moved was so that they could get in and see what? Nothing. Because he wasn't there. Stones are removed. Obstacles are removed for our benefit. I, I love the story of Christ. He shows up. He's there with them. So then you might be thinking, well, okay, I get it. He did, they could have left that stone up there and Jesus could have got wherever he wanted. He showed up in a locked room. Oh, so Pastor Steve, you're basically saying he was a ghost. He was just like a spirit. Because spirits can kind of come and go, right, without, without that. And by the way, there was a whole group in the early church that believed that. They were called Gnostics. They were heretics. They taught, and this is about the year 100 AD. It's further down the line, but they taught we just can't buy this resurrection nonsense. We believe that he just rose in spirit and then he popped up like a ghost in these places. It's a problem with that. Jesus told doubting Thomas, he said, oh, you don't believe? Come on, touch me. Put your hand, put your finger where they stuck the spear in my side. You want to put your Put your fingers in the holes in my hands because that's what you just told everybody before you would believe you'd have to do that. And he did. In Mary Magdalene, by the way, when she saw the risen Christ, she dropped it in front of him and another gospel says she clasped his feet. You don't hold on to the legs of a ghost. Furthermore, last time I checked, ghosts don't sit down and make fish and eat with the disciples in the risen Christ did that. So we have a glorified body, same body that you and I are all going to get. It can't be touched. It can't, it's real. It's not a ghost. And it was alive and well. And that's incredible. This is where I want to kind of just, we'll bring it into the, I got about three more minutes. I'm going to bring this in. I think I would just want to go back to that whole thing of, the barriers of belief or barriers, the things that stand between you and Christ. And are you going to retreat and go home in fear because you think that those are too impossible? There's no way that you're going to get through whatever it is to get to Christ to have the intimacy of relationship that you desire to have. <clears throat> I've given you a term at this church about how we need to fail forward. I've said that many times. If you're going to fail, if you're going to trip up, if you're going to sin, when you fall down, once you fall towards Jesus and get back up and take another step. You're going to fail again, fall towards Jesus. Eventually, you'll get to where you're going. But I want to give you a new term this morning. I want to call it faith forward. You've heard of face forward? I want to say faith forward. As you face the impossibilities that are barriers to you in your life, and I don't care what they are. It can be cancer. It can be divorce. It can be whatever it is. And you see no possibility of resolution in that thing. You get your boys with you. You get your girls with you. You get your spices with you. You know what the spices are. They were going to go worship him. Worship means worth ship. It means I am going to ascribe a worth to anything. And so when we worship something, we bring the best of who we are and we worship him with our time, our talents, our treasure. The spices was their form of worship. When you're up against it, friends, you go get your boys, guys. Ladies, you go get your girls. And you say, will you walk with me? 
and you take a walk of faith towards what that barrier is, that what's holding you in the ground, and you say, well, look, even the three of us can't roll that stone away. You're right, but our God can. This is how I'm going to end this. This is a good way to end it. Who will roll the stone away? God will. The same God who has always removed obstacles and barriers. See, we serve a God who opens and closes doors. And if God wants to open and close a door, he's going to do it. There's nothing you can do about it. I've tried opening locked doors a lot in my life. A lot of them were for this church. We would have had this thing built in the third year if I would have had all the doors open that I wanted open. And God said, no, you're not going to do that. Let's just review a little bit of the scripture. Garden of Eden, right? There's the tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. After the fall, what does God place? Not there yet. Go back to the, the other ones where you jumped ahead. <laughs> Give them the pictures where they're locked out, right? God placed an angel. No, that's Noah. <laughs> okay. God put an angel in front of the Garden of Eden. Why did he do that? She's just mad. I don't, I don't want them going back in here. It was nice. They messed up. I'm going to punish them. Not at all. You see, once they had entered into sin, if they would have eaten that from the tree that allowed them to live forever, they would have lived eternally in sin with a condition that could have never been resolved. And so God put a barrier between the tree that was within and said, yeah, there we go, that's it. Can't go there. What did he do with the tree? See, he locked off the one door, but it was temporary. When God locks a door in your life, it's for your benefit. <laughs> He's helping you. It's not punishment. You want something and God's saying you can't have it? It's for your benefit. They take that tree, they, Father, Son, Spirit, one God, and it's been transplanted. It will be in the new Jerusalem. It will be for the healing of the nations. Now you can show those other pictures. We will all eat from the fruit. Now, that's the real orchard rage right there. That's the, the fruit you want to eat from. There's a guard there. The ark. Who closed the door? Noah built the ark, but who closed him in? It says, and God shut him in, Genesis 7, 16. How about Peter in Acts? We're going to read about it. It's coming up. He was locked in jail. The Lord sent an angel and unlocked the prison doors. He gets out goes to where the church was, and they were at Rhoda's house, and he knocks on the door. See, Peter isn't like Jesus. He just doesn't walk through doors. He doesn't have a glorified body. He's like us. So he knocks on the door. Rhoda comes to the door. He says, hey, it's Peter. And she doesn't even let him in. She's so excited. She runs into the house and says, Peter's out there. He says, they didn't believe. Do you notice a pattern of believers not believing? I mean, you don't have that problem, do you? Come on. Hey, believers, believe. So then she comes back, opens the door. He goes in. The Red Sea obstacle. They got an ocean behind them. Jesus removes the obstacle. We are going to read this one because we have to. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. This is the power. This is resurrection power here. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons that we fight with. If you fight in the flesh, you know what you're going to do? This is how you fight in the flesh. You use your power, your influence, you use the law. You get your friends with you. You go pick a fight. You, you manipulate an outcome. In faith, you say, no. I got to come over here. I got to fight with different weapons. I'm going to fight. I'm going to faith forward. I'm going to give this crisis to Christ. I'm going to have him fight this battle for me. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, to demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up like big rocks in front of a tomb against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought, and we make it obedient to Christ. That's the God you have that can knock down barriers. And then the big one, the, the curtain that was torn in Mark 15, 38, 
that is no longer there. Can we put up Ephesians 2, 13 and 14? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, Revelation 3.20 says this, Jesus said this. There's one door that Jesus could open, but he won't. He won't because he gives you a choice. You're empowered with free will. And this is a door that out of respect for you, he he won't open that door. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock, just like Peter. Just like Peter in Rhoda. If anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with that person they with me. You've got to open that door. Jesus won't knock it down. What are your barriers? What are your rocks? What are your Roman soldiers? You're trying to get to the power of the risen Christ. I'm going to leave you with these questions. Number one, are you walking with at least two brothers that you can tell anything to? Are you walking with two sisters that you can tell anything to? Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. You walk by yourself, you're crushed every time. The devil owns your butt. He owns you. You're stuck. Last thing is, will you open the door that's within? Will you allow him to come in? Let's pray. Father, we love you wholeheartedly. There's a lot going on here. I pray that for the person here that has a barrier based on disappointment, they, had the, they thought what they had the promise of God. They thought that it was going to turn out a certain kind of a way. And it didn't turn out that way. And they don't know why it didn't turn out that way. But it ended, in the case of, it, it ended badly. And they're, they're, that's a barrier for them. Would you help that person overcome that barrier of disappointment? God, maybe that disappointment has led to a barrier of unbelief. How can I believe in a God who this, that, and the other thing? Oh, God, help us when we have these seasons of doubts, when the clouds come rolling in, strengthened by our brothers and sisters. May we faith forward on. May we just keep taking the next step, even though we don't know how we're going to, who's going to roll the stone away. And believe by faith that at the right time, you will. And Lord, lastly, would you help the brother or sister who is their own rock. They're their own barrier to unbelief because they won't kneel at your feet and say, I, am, I sign away the rights of my life. I will no longer be the king of my universe. You will be the king of my universe. God, to that person, <laughs> you will give the keys to the kingdom. Thank you for all of this. May your will and your word be done.
that we are invited into new life through his death and resurrection. I thank God that the God who was rolling stones back when Jesus was out of that tomb is the same God who's rolling away stones in our lives today. So this week, faith forward. Walk boldly forward, trusting that God's going to roll some stones away in your life. Have a great week, guys.